we'll just give it a couple minutes, let people come in when we get started. All right, we're up to about 50 now, but let others come in as they come. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the sixth installment of the spring 2021 lecture series titled Crisis. I'm Leland, and I'm joined by the student lecture series committee composed of Gates Breeden, Connor Brown, Tim Cox, Connor Widener, Keith Hack, Aria Hill, Matthias Montenegro Sandoval, Emma Sweden, Benjamin Sturkey, and Jake Swartz. So I'd like to extend our warmest welcome to our guest speaker tonight, Emmanuel Pratt of Sweetwater Foundation in Chicago. And we're really grateful to have him here tonight in co-sponsorship with the Charles Burchard grant of the Alpha Rho Pi Foundation. Uh, just a reminder to everyone that this lecture is gonna be recorded for the school's distributive purposes. And just to refresh everyone on the functions in this Zoom world, uh, feel free to use the chat to publicly ask your questions or submit questions privately to myself or um, another member of our committee. And they can be asked during the Q&A portion of this event. Now, you can also use the raise your hand function at the bottom of your screen and we'll be more than happy to have you turn on your microphone and your video and ask Emmanuel your question and participate in discussion. So I'm gonna read a short bio on Emmanuel and then we'll get started. Okay. Emmanuel is an artist, urban designer and a MacArthur fellow based in Chicago. He is a co-founder of and executive director of Sweetwater Foundation, which is a 501c3 organization that utilizes a unique blend of agriculture, woodworking, art, experiential education, and community scale production to transform so-called blighted spaces and abandoned buildings into eco economically and ecologically productive community assets. Emmanuel's praxis involves more than a decade of explorations, investigations, and transdisciplinary work that intersect architecture, urban planning, agriculture, and public health. His work has built upon and moved beyond the theory of communicative action towards the creation of a new paradigm called Regenerative Neighborhood Development, or R&D. So this R&D is an urban acupuncture inspired and emergent design process that dynamically cultivates intentional acts of civic arts and participatory design as integral components to reimagine the urban ecology of the built environment. At its core, R&D concentrates on the transformative processes of building public trust as evidenced by the transformation of four contiguous city blocks into what has become known as the Commonwealth, located at the intersection of Washington Park and Englewood on the Chicago South Side. Emmanuel Pratt was an, a visiting lecturer at Taubman College, a Harvard GSD Loeb Fellow in 2017, and is also a 2019 Joyce Award recipient. So Emmanuel, we are very excited to have you here tonight. Uh, please take it away. Cool. Um, so thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here. It's always um, interesting, um, interesting how and why 
uh, we get contacted <clears throat> by so many different types of students and faculty and facets and transdisciplinary. It's just an interest. It's a yeah, it's a challenging moment. It's an interesting moment in the world. Um, and so I don't go into these moments lightly. I go into these as what they should be as historical record. This is a, a moment to be recorded as historical record to hopefully move towards the right direction for humanity. So with that, uh, I'm gonna share a screen. The first 10 minutes, um, I think appropriately will be like a history lesson. Share. Thumbs up. Okay, so rather than focusing on just strictly crisis, because we're constantly bombarded by crisis after crisis, um, I wanted to focus on how to work through crisis. Um, this is a tremendous moment to rethink pretty much everything foundationally. So cultivating public trust is the focus and theme. And with respect to history, um, I was curious how many people know about this. Um, this Abraham Lincoln on uh, April, I mean, sorry, September 30th, 1859, gave a keynote address to the Wisconsin State Agricultural Society. Um, it's fascinating, at the State Fair, 1859, historical context, nation in crisis, precursor to Civil War, right? Um, Every, he said in this speech, where he's contemplating the future of the country around everything. Every blade of grass is a study. Um, recurring that education is a cultivated thought, can best be combined with agriculture, labor, any labor through the principle of thorough work, grounded, applied, action-oriented research work. So this was 1859. In this, he said, uh, in this book, learning is available. Every form of learning is available. Botany, chemistry, philosophy, even how to think about machinery. Um, I'm not sure how many people would know about this, but you know there was a thing at the time between the Douglas Lincoln, Stephen Douglas and Lincoln, where there's a debate about what to do with black folks in America, African Americans, slaves. Um, labor capital, there was a theory called the mudsill theory. It was a foundational theory that folks that were not white, that were a part of the lower class or team to be, well, not even human, um, were nothing more than just labor and bound to be any form of hired labor was fatally conditioned to be it, that of a slave. Um, it was a justification for slavery on the South. Um, and then <laughs> Lincoln said another class of reasoners, that's an interesting statement as a jab in the debate, hold the opinion that labor is independent of capital. This is a really tricky one because he says that it's actually superior to capital because it could exist outside of capital. Work does not have to be bounded by capital. However, the reality is, is the country was um, trying to figure out what to do around labor and work and human exploitation that built the country. Um, so he's thinking that you know the future of the country needs to think about soil, needs to think about what we do with cities and the future of cities, populations as they grow, populations as they change. And if you can command and understand the art of land and the art of science, which is fundamentally supposed to be architecture, no community whose every member possesses this art can ever be the victim of oppression in any of its forms. So this is 1859. Soon thereafter, 1859, 1860s, elected president, 1860 is when the USDA was formed. The US Department of Agriculture with a focus on trying to figure out the future of economics and agriculture in the country. Uh, Senator Justin Morrill, um, push forward the Morrill Act, which I don't know if anyone is familiar with this, but this 
set forth sales of millions of acres of federal land, public land, to create higher education institutions, such as Virginia Tech. Uh, it was the foundation upon which land grant schools were formed. Sales of public land with a focus on, I don't know if you can see the second point, agriculture, mechanical industries and arts, and military tactics. This is the foundation of the land grant schools and institutions. Um, it was carved up into a political frame so that it was, again, if you look closely, is a committee of public lands. And then it was, how do we get land to these education, to the institutions? And you already know who it favors. So the Homestead Act subsequently followed. And it said that any citizen over 21 years of old, at age, as the head of a household, that could prove that there was, there was going to be work and value added to the land would be given 160 acres of land, 21 years old. This is an example of the land patent, AKA the deed that started a very, very, very complicated relationship or re-relationship or disruption to the land. So the question is, where is this land? Who is actually on that land? So the com combination of this moving forward, that was 1862 starts a precedent for this emancipatory process. Liberation of land that is actually starting to break the back of agriculture and slavery. And it says emancipation proclamation, you are your slave, you're now free. However, it wasn't until August 10th, 1863, when Frederick Douglass showed up to the White House, stood in line, stood in line at the White House, got called into the White House, and said, we have no reason to believe you. Why would we believe you? You should let us go front, fight front lines for something we believe in and be paid and valued so we can be, so we can believe you. And subsequently, you know, the war, civil war, we know the results. Um, we know the catastrophe of the wars, the USDA was formed and it started a land grant institution process. Here's a map of the land grant. What most people don't understand is that this was in 11 million acres of indigenous territory, 250 tribes, a lot of treaties that were violently enacted. So um, this is untold history. If you look up landgrabu.org, landgrab, this is from that. Um, so they've remapped and relooked and examined at the historical context of where the land came from, who was on the land, um, how much money was redistributed, and which institutions reaped the most benefit. So again, it was, comes from a act of public land for 11 million acres of land to be distributed to these institutions for a certain value, devaluing by act anything that did not fit within the bounded rationality of their value and economic system. So I would encourage you to spend some more time at Land Grab U. Subsequently, if you know anything about the Reconstruction era, it was a period when 1860, you know, after the Civil War into 1890, where it was an opportunity to rethink everything. We're, current, we're currently in a reconstruction moment, um, but we had the Great Migration, which accelerated when you lose your support for the land in the South and you migrate to belong, to fit into cities and for, for work. There's a Great Migration that predominantly hit the Midwest, East Coast, what have you, um, which caused another policy, which was the underwriting manual for the, after the Great Depression for the uh, Housing Authority, April 1st, 1936. The racial restrictive covenants that explicitly said no property in said 
uh, additions or properties uh, will be rented, leased, or whatever to anyone that is not white or Caucasian race. If a neighborhood is to retain its stability, it needs to have racial occupancy and stability, otherwise it will result in a loss of value. Homeowning Loan Corporation moved forward with this, red line maps ensued, uh, and then the tax, the sorry, the insurance maps that accelerated the redlining said anywhere that is not white, anywhere that is other should be, it, you cannot value it and it needs to be reinforced. Um, if you really want to learn more about this, there's a, a number of, uh, of mappings that, that show this history. Um, this is one important one. Washington Park, I'm actually two, two miles away from, uh, less than two miles away from Washington Park. A fine park, uh, completely monopolized by the colored race. Um, it basically says, unless you can enact a real estate protective association strong enough to restrict the colored people, Washington Park is doomed. So this is explicit language. So subsequently you get landscapes of uneven development. It's pretty clear. Here's an example of how that plays out. 1949, you have a reconversion housing project, federal housing authority that says colored people into the area. Fast forward 2012, it's hollowed out. How many generations? How much value? What value? Who's valued? Why is it valued or not valued? So you get an interplay of meaning and value that plays across space. And this terminology called blight is a tricky one. If you watch any of my other talks, you know, I'm pretty consistent with this. Um, blight is actually a term in paleontology and study of plants and it's the death and decay of a crop so that it no longer sustains life. That was used to translate to the built environment and an economic valuation or devaluation of certain populations and neighborhoods that said, if you are a blighted neighborhood, that is a damning statement. Blighted properties, blighted neighborhoods. It translates to the population that is there. That you are of no value, tabula rasa, wipe it clean. It was the foundation upon which urban re renewal was founded. Um, so it becomes a pres prescriptive pathology of this chronic urban problems, deterioration, poverty, unemployment, health issues, environment, education, all of this thing that are siloed, they're actually all very much intertwined. So it plays out visually as an aesthetic. It's traumatizing. The process of erasure is traumatizing. It's a forced amnesia. You don't know what's happening there. And so in certain neighborhoods, more so than others, the value is constantly in flux, it's constantly being devalued, and then there's an erasure. Who at this point is thinking about or caring about the land? Who is caring about the air? The act of taking a fire hose and just demonstrating as if you're controlling the particulates in the air, which is completely bogus. This is ridiculous. This is public water off of a hydrant sprayed for hours during the demolition not deconstruction, not saving the material. These are, mater these are houses for, from 1860 to 1890. This is around the corner. No one's thinking about the other intangibles, root shock. If you are displaced, there is an, there is an emotional outcome of this displacement, of this devaluation. That is an intangible. It doesn't fit within an externality of modeling. It doesn't fit within an economic parameter. It's the cost of development. So that we've, we've adopted a process of degeneration. We don't think about, there was actually welfare and, and just by put, doing a predatory housing approach, uh, blockbustering and other things, $3.2 billion of just dollars of wealth was lost because of these racist practices in real estate between 1950 and 1970 in Chicago alone. That does not factor in subsequently what does police, policing, devaluing, under, closing of schools, uh, <laughs> lack of health care. That does not factor into all these equations. And it embodies and is just, just, it keeps reiterating this concept of value that has racial tones. Um, 
I put this up because if you if you have not had a chance to look at the other America from uh, Dr. King, racism is based on an ontological affirmation. It is the notion that the very being of a people is inferior and the ultimate logic of racism is genocide. You do not fit, you do not value. Frederick Douglass challenged this amongst others. He said, there's actually not a Negro problem. There's been, there's been a lot of discussions about how, what, what is the basis upon which this is built. It was just about alienation and othering. And he said, look, the problem is whether we can have a loyalty enough to honor and live up to our actual constitution collectively. So this is the question of value. How do you value? Noun and verb, what is the value? How do you value? If what is the, the rationality upon which you value and how do you break beyond your norm of bounded rationality, the limits of your cognitive process, the limits of your awareness and understandings. So the subsequent relationship of the development and architectural and aesthetic typology of these types of built form, I'll switch my language a little bit, is that you get these campuses that become monolithic forms, glass, high flash, these enclosing spaces within the same neighborhoods that just got erased. It sends signals subliminally and superliminally that who belongs, who doesn't, but it also has a certain kind of look and aesthetic and feel. I mean, these are, look at all the windows. There's a so-called transparency. There's a certain type of programming. Anybody's welcome, but that's not really true if you actually don't have an ID and key card, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm, I see smiles. So um, we must be speaking similar language that you understand. So then you, you have this stadium type of look and feel really beautiful, pretty, but it sets in motion an othering. And then this is actually in Chicago, like this is a student center, which is beautiful. Um, on the campus of University of Chicago, you get these island effects that has a really, really deep kind of trauma, traumatic history of relationship to land or lack thereof or relationship community lack thereof. So it creates this othering again, live here, Come here, this is for you, it's not for others. In Chicago, there's a landscape of all of these universities and we're right in the middle of all of it. So there's a superliminal and subliminal messaging. There's expli like explicit policy, language, valuation, and then there's a subliminal message that comes across all the time. And then you add the green and sustainable discussion. What is green? What is sustainable? Is this really green? A utopian idealism of just putting trees on every floor that goes up 100, I don't know, what's the, what's the weight of water? 8.34 gallons, 8.34 pounds per gallon rather. What is the weight of water? How does it work? What does this look like in Chicago or anywhere else in the winter? Is this really food? If you just do lettuce, indoor, controlled, with just light. What is the cost of your electric bill? Who then actually can eat this lettuce? Does it actually deal with food? So here's a campus example, you know, LEED certified, it's great. It's an interesting form. However, who is it for? When you start these forms of developments that have an ecological twist, is this a park for all? Really? It depends on a lot of the contextualization and the costs and the der derivations and the return on investment or who defines a return on investment. And when you just talk about a garden, you're constantly devalued. And the reality is that everybody is looking at these impact investment models for what to do with this. It's all based on big data, but half the data is not even actually accurate. It's not informed appropriately. It's not informed. The people who are on the ground that have the actual tacit knowledge that know what's happening on the ground are excluded from the conversation. So this issue of trust, how do we believe anybody <laughs> anymore? This is, this is, you know, where do we start? How do we start? There's trust as in hope. There's trust as in care. 
But there's also trust is in value. So what is public trust? So with the theme of crisis, how do we work through crisis? This is a historical crisis. This is a climate crisis. It's a humanitarian crisis. So it's time for it of all times, it's a global pandemic. It is time pandemic. It is time for the paradigm shift of all times. If there ever was one, it is now. So we call ourselves solutionaries. We're surrounded by problems, but we focus on the solutions. And we inherited that term as a gift of conversation with folks from the Grace Lee Boggs Center in the network in Detroit and other folks. We're solutionaries. And I challenge you all to be solutionaries. Our tagline is there grows the neighborhood. We focus on R&D, pun intended, research and design, nope, regenerative neighborhood development. Because it is an iterative process. It is an urban acupuncture inspired thing. Try something, look at understand the distress points, understand how it is responding, leave space for biodynamic feedback, what is residents, nature, learn by doing, iterate, iterate, iterate. So we operate within the third sector. Between the public and private sector where everybody's trying to figure out what to do, we're just doing it. Shaping the conversation, part of the conversation in the intersection of the social economy. So rather than focusing on overtech, alienation, other stuff that is degenerative, we focus on the regenerative, less energy, maximizations of human cultivation, not just labor, is an intersection of agri architecture, agriculture, aquaponics, just transdisciplinary. It is actually planning, it's real planning. Um, so quick recap, the early stages, we started off in schools around looking at aquaponics and hydroponics and just looking at, you know, it's a great way to look at urban ecology in real time. When you have fish in water, with energy that goes to the plants and then you have a filtration system with the lights and you know, it just, it just creates a really interesting biodynamics dynamic space. When you start to add technology to it and you have Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, monitoring systems, you look at the role of biomimetic informatics, biomimetic informatics systems, biologically informed metrics and analytic systems that respect nature, that you share. These are all open source platforms. So you learn how to hack a Tupperware system and use wasted resources like plastic bottles that otherwise go into the Pacific Ocean into currents. Instead, you turn it into a year round aquaponic hydroponic system that you're growing your lettuce and vegetables and peppers It's pretty damn cool. When you apply it in an actual classroom that has been devalued in select neighborhoods, it's even that much more dynamically exponentially cooler because you're actually impacting and activating education connected learning for real, building real time, building human infrastructure, building physical infrastructure, creating human relationships, creating art form in the plants, celebrating the art of nature, but then also creating the space that celebrates the space. So we did a bunch of iterations of this, in, installed it into art galleries created art galleries and transformed them into classroom spaces, bringing people who have not been into those spaces to be welcomed into those spaces, to create a platform for conversation, making it sexy, aestheticizing it, doing the future of food, all that, flash, 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 MDF material, it's probably not ideal. However, we get to talk about materiality, life cycle analysis, so also. Translated to a neighborhood is a, real, is a different game. That's a showroom thing. This is real world. When you start to do neighborhood stabilization and community outreach, when you start human infrastructure first and get to know who people are and why people are. We created an apprenticeship program, connected learning, pilot program, talk about local economy, but we started with that exact same location that I showed in Washington Park that was hollowed out. Washington Park, Inglewood at the intersection of a neighborhood who's the lo lowest life expectancy in, in the city of Chicago, looking at 69 years old, um, lost the majority of its population, has been devalued for generations, had one of the worst schools in the history of Chicago on the site. 
that was known as a pipeline prison, literally. So you have two acres of land that has no market value. How does that happen? Worked with the city, turned into a farm. Not just any farm, not an urban farm. We called it a community farm. These naming conventions are very important. Renaming it. What is a community farm? How many community farms you get? What does that actually mean? Not just an urban farm. We're in the city of Chicago. Well, actually, the population density of this space, of this area and neighborhood, is technically rural because of the loss. But creating a new norm, and in that new norm, we started to rethink the housing typology. The housing that was devalued at one point put at $460,000. Foreclosed for 31, we turned it into a community school. Think, do, house. So change the program to welcome people in, which is economically irrational, but human, hum, humanity tilted. We said, come in, let's have a conversation. Let's share some food. Let's put some chalk on the wall and write on the wall. Let's do some art. Let's do some colonology and you know, share food, share experiences. Have Mama Betty, who's anchor of root and wisdom, share her history, great migration, share presentations, get some feedback. Do some art inspired by nature. Make a t-shirt inspired by the art. Learn how to do your own thing. So we step, before kale became the, like the popular thing, um, we were growing kale right outside with the strawberries right outside. Um, having these kind of farm to table experiences that were not $1,000 a plate, it was just for the network. Creating an actual market on that site was really interesting. An interpersonal dynamic, not just the you know, algorithm in the stock market, to have real value, to create human relationships between elders and youth, to create formal explorations like this living bench typology that says, hey, let's design something that has this landscaping but it becomes a space to welcome people to sit where the sidewalk was never finished, finished we created a platform for people to come and engage. So we opened it up to the public, transformed the space, transformed now children making memories with family, children playing. They call it a playground. If they had a skateboard, they'd be all over it. We, we cannot let that happen because of public liability. Uh, we have had public backflips. So um, Having food and education, you see the school bus, it was not uncommon to become a destination point for a field trip for schools. Like that's so energizing and rewarding, but not valued by a current economic system that does not value education in that way. It's a cost of development. You don't want all that. Elders to come in and say, I know how to do this. I'm from Mississippi, Arkansas, Alabama, great migration. I love this. Cultivate wisdom, knowledge, sharing it, touching that broccoli. Some people just never seen broccoli grow. Touching and interacting with the food that you cultivate and then sharing it and creating the spaces for music to resonate, creating the spaces for memories to be formed. All the while nature is doing its thing, the ecology of the place is radically transforming. So we have more bees, native bees, monarch butterflies, moths, hummingbirds, crickets, praying mantises, all of this stuff, that's a native bee. Having all of this just transform the landscape over time, while no one's paying attention, we're paying attention, creates a different type of ecological awareness and appreciation and sensitivity to nature. Growing up with this and respecting and using iNaturalist as a AI, I could take a picture of this and then run it through AI and understand the technology that lets me know what type of species this is and what's the history and pattern. And like, that's the appropriate use of technology to respect nature. We had a hummingbird show up. So, but then we had this waste stream that is constantly the byproduct as an externality, cost of development. Put windows in there, throw it away. We have a culture that throws away wood AKA throwing away trees. So the crates and pallets that we find in the neighborhood, get some pickup trucks, <laughs> literally load it up, build the greenhouse as a public work 
shop, get it, work, shop. So the naming convention is important because then on that public space, instead of calling it a vacant lot, it's public space. Creating a carpentry dimension of the urban ecology platform, super important because you're learning how to appreciate the grain, the woods, how to build not just individually, but also collectively. It's on the same spot that had no value, no market value. So you learn to draw, you learn how to do SketchUp and Rhino and Revit, learn how to build. High school students, we get the opportunity as urban ecology apprentices with mentors. We call that apprenticeship for a reason, to, to value the mentorship. So this is pre-COVID, obviously, but really, really cultivating a, a nice workflow, understanding the, the cultivation and balance between education and work and materials and life cycles and design, how to express an idea, how to share it, how to value public space. You see the heart in the background out of the trees <laughs> that were cut down. Uh, so we attracted a, a support from Art Place America, which was pretty profound because they believed in the creative placemaking. And then we, we, we all can discuss another time what creative placemaking means and how that approach is fundamentally colonial. However, if you approach it the right way to support actual local initiatives, um, you create these new dynamic opportunities. So why not design a barn? challenge the architectural typology of a barn and hand raise a barn that was modeled after a barn from 1856 to do a communal hand raising block party of a barn structure that then becomes the epicenter for people to come together. So we call it the thought barn. Got a, got a good idea, meet us at the thought barn. Cultivate the thought at the thought barn. Very intentional naming. naming. Then play in the streets for our Juneteenth celebrations at the Commons. Juneteenth, celebration of freedom. Not just when slaves were actually found out about this Emancipation Proclamation, but actual freedom. What is the possibility of hope? What is the possibility of this? So it becomes a new type of destination point locally, regionally, nationally, globally where we can celebrate culture and tradition, art, music, public ceremony, public gathering, public food, public art. Um, and then the seasons change and you get lost in the sunflowers. It's pretty amazing. So people are like, I thought y'all was growing food. Where's that? Why are you sunflowers? Well, squirrels and the birds did a lot to that. <laughs> every, time they, every time they go to see it, they drop and then <laughs> sunflowers everywhere. So the aesthetic transformations and the iterate, iterations, the heuristics, trial and error with the information based off the information you have available and do it better next time. Start to create a welcome, welcoming space, a place, an invitation beyond just an open door, a space for intention, a space to trust, a space to heal, a space to share for anybody that is wood that t-rex we have these puppet shows by these amazing international artists that you see the vat you see the faces and expression of those kids like you can't tell them that thing is not real and that's wood scraps that these amazing artists perform in this space at the thought barn gathering spaces. Now, you change the light, you change the look, the feel, you change the mood. It resonates, it glows. We started taking the vacant land, transforming it, creating platforms, new forms of expression during the architecture biennial. Talking about housing, talking about the possibility of new housing. Then it goes to the cultural center and people say, where'd our house go? I thought it was for us. So we said, boom, we got you. Let's do another one. In the same spot and the same platform, we created what is now known as the meeting house. This is also reclaimed wood, Shosugiban charring it, all the techniques, 
but a collaborative platform upon which we built the structure that the, the neighbors started to use as a park, the R&D park. As it starts to form feedback, biodynamic feedback and memories, folks that have lived in the neighborhood forever, they say, come back and say, I remember when, I remember when. Building starts to shake shape. Well, the pavilion takes shape. And instead of just having it just be a, a, a structure, we turned it into, especially during COVID, during a global pandemic and crisis, turned it into a public greenhouse. So then when we had to start to change our look and feel with masks and different types of engagement and six foot protocols, we responded accordingly. So the R&D park was appropriately the space to become space for our public park, for the community, who where the rest of all of the schools and everything shut down, you wanna have a celebration, you can come to our space. We curated social distance practices for health and wellness for everybody in the neighborhood, in a neighborhood that does not have access to healthcare. And we fed people and dollars showed up. People understand the value of food, especially when there's a riot, especially when there's a rebellion, especially when everything shuts down. Value of education goes up. The value of the wood goes up. Actually, literally the value of wood. If you look at the timber prices that have gone up exponentially because of the COVID crisis, this reclaiming practice makes so much more sense. So we still created products, even better. We created up new projects, even better. Education got better. Connections got better. The production got better. The education platform got better. We started using Zoom and Google Meet. We can meet more people. We the publics, a manifesto return truth to democracy and the public. So engaging with our neighbors more, engaging publicly, and creating a social distance market space to do live cooking demonstrations. To create a space where people are like, I gotta get out the house. Well, you can do it safely, but come and check us out. Cause we got a market. We got Thad who cultivates the bees. We got honey for you. And we got the honeycombs that we did with the reclaimed wood. Part of our urban ecology, we, the pop-up stands are just all local wood. Big Mike doing canes out of the wood from the park. Had to think water collection. So taking an IVC system, an intermediate bulk container from waste streams of our system, 300 gallon capacity, really 275, but for the sake of math, 300 gallon capacity. 300 gallons times 8.34 gallons is a, is a catastrophe if you don't know how to build it and design it but you create a butterfly, we call it the monarch tower, butterfly row structure for ex, you know, exponentially catching more water to use on our site so we can offset. So we started looking at solar capacities added to that, refining, refining, refining. So as the potatoes are just growing and as our market is just getting better, as our strategies are getting better, we're overflowing with produce, literally spilling out the kitchen to the market and cultivating, cultivating, cultivating the aesthetics, the feel, adding solar panels and a fence to the reconstruction house that was from 1891 that we renovated across the street, found these memories in the house that otherwise would have been erased, demolished by the traditional system, one person erasing it. We turned it into a the ground floor as an art gallery for the neighborhood, for local artists but we celebrate the memories in the space. We created a space for Riccardi, Rhonda Long, and other folks that do other artwork that doesn't find its way in traditional galleries, but then all of a sudden it has more value. It has more resonance, it has more stories. And then it finds its way into another gallery, spaces of memory. So we allowed for the recordings to happen within the space. And then we broadcast select conversations out and memory across cities cooking, cultivating, transforming space, welcoming new guests from Detroit, Philly, Baltimore, South Africa, Philippines, what have you. 
Then down the block, we have a church that was a relic of a past. It was actually started off as a housing typology that then added a 10 foot addition, which is that second section, but then became a church, 1920s. But then right down the block from a historic landmark, this is a historically black church, small footprint, 1800 square feet or so, has no value. We acquired it and said, let's go through and understand it. Let's talk to neighbors. Let's talk to folks who have memories here. Let's look at it. Let's actually study the aesthetics, the brick, the material, the transformation, this mysterious odd bump out that no one can figure out what the hell this thing is. It looks like it's windows. It's on the north side, but it doesn't make any sense why it only adds 25 square feet of programming to the, like, what is this thing? There's no window behind there. So we're like, boom, let's make it into the civic arts church. What is civic in the 21st century? What is civic supposed to be? What civic can be? Engagement, art, what is the role of art? For who, by who, with who? And what is the church? Let's just play and understand what the possibilities are. So we're looking at these scissor trusses that we're transforming the space, still looking at the brick and the materiality, still looking at how we can spatially dynamicize this stuff. So it's a gallery on the ground floor, humans in residence, not artists only, humans in residence on the basement in the furnace, cranking out that good work. Um, and then we refined our practices. Anybody made a mallet before? It's a really cool project. Wasted wood, flip it, learn how to do a mortise and tenon, learn how to do an actual shoulder collar for it, learn how to use, make a wedge, boom, use some chisels for real. Don't hurt yourself, you, you, you lose these. Um, so making a mall mallet out of this wasted wood. Bomb. So it's the best education. Then you make these wasted pro wasted wood scraps and you prolong the life of the wood. It's wood, it's trees, it's beauty. New products, guys, yeah, some Japanese saws in the mix. Um, still producing and cultivating life, celebrating life throughout the winter. Four below, we're still growing. Snow outside, we're still growing. Harvesting. Thinking about common wealth, not politics, not political jargon or rhetoric, actual common collective wealth. Well, people talk about the Green New Deal, here it is. Reconnecting our consciousness, see, touch, taste, hear, smell in the real world. Because we, the publics, demand better. We, the people, suck. We can do better. But we, the public's demands that we do better. So at the Commonwealth, our values are regeneration, small is beautiful, chaotic, balance of chaos and order, chaotism. Sankofa, reach back to be present to move forward. We have a seventh generation principle, like indigenous practices. We have inherited the earth, we got to do better. We need to have our Children's 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 children embrace something better. And we're open source. Tear it up. If you know anything about the Creative Commons, you, you know that you, you tear it up and down. Um, so we had these Sanko for Living Memories celebrations where we can honor our elders, we can honor our futures. Um, question, has anybody ever come across this? The Negro Rural School and its relationship to the community. So this is published by Tuskegee in 1915 as part of the school is a combination of the Department of Education, Architecture, Agriculture, and Mechanical Industries. This was the foundation upon which George Washington Carver and Booker T. Washington said, I think there's a way that while we cannot get public education, we cannot get school, we cannot get this during the after the reconstruction era in the rural south to create schools. So the rural schoolhouses unfortunately were rebranded by the Rosenwald as the Rosenwald schools. Rosenwald is the president of Sears who met Booker T. Washington at the YMCA, said, if you can give me some why, and actually in Chicago, I will sponsor 
your schoolhouses. The schoolhouses were a dynamically flexible space to celebrate the community for education. And it was the way that the majority of my folks got education because we weren't valued. So you build it, you cultivate it. And if you go to school there, you get actual housing. If you teach there, you get housing. It's part of community. And is this, these are not historical landmarks. But now is a new opportunity for new conversations. And so I, I part with this. Um, I, I have a, I'm very much a fan of Frederick Douglass. I have him on my arms. Um, so it's the picture of life contrasted with the contrasted with the fact of life, the ideal contrasted with the real, which makes criticism possible. Discussions that move beyond just the bounded rationality. If it doesn't work, if it's not working, it's time to change. Where there is no criticism, there is no progress. There grows a neighborhood. So we open it up. Questions? Yeah, thank you, Emmanuel, for that awesome talk. Um, I'm really excited for this round of discussion, actually. So um, just want to remind everyone that if you have questions, you can just type them in the chat publicly. You can send them to me, or actually even better, just turn on your camera and join us on the screen. So I'll let y'all yeah, we can handle that. Yeah. All right. So let's see. I can start off with um, something that we've prepared to give some. Unless Sharon, Sharon, you want to? I don't need to start things off. Apologies, I'm Go in ahead. my home. <laughs> this is our live. This is this is how life works. We you no apologies <laughs> needed. There's kids screaming in the background. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Remember, I wanted, remember, like, was it CNN where like the kid came running into the room and everybody was oh like, God, oh, yeah. that ever happened? And now it's like everybody's norm. Yeah. Um, thank you for an amazing talk. Um, I have a, a question that's kind of a rhetorical question, but um, as I was watching the talk, I was thinking about this, and I'm one of the faculty here at Virginia Tech. Um, this sort of contradiction tension that I always deal with, which is that. As an architecture professor, I'm fascinated by design and yep. form, but I feel like when one, that sometimes the application of design and form doesn't necessarily, it, sometimes it's in tension or contrast, contradiction yep. with a community's needs. And what I was so impressed with, and you know, my husband is here and we're watching the talk, you know, these beautiful benches and sheds that you've designed. And I'm guessing that where, you know, the answer to my question is that, how one marries those two is that this is coming from a community and the community's needs. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, so, ooh, we don't have another hour for this discussion and we don't have a PhD for a time for it. So, but there is a, there is a predicated notion that somehow design fixes the world, right? There is, a, there is an architectural bias or design bias or artistic bias that we know more good design and therefore and it's, it's just the wrong starting point because it's a classist, it's a top-down, it's a hierarchical alienating starting point. If it's different, like, hey, you know, do you know the average size of a, of a, of a seat? The average person kind of intuitively knows, but if you translate it and say it's around, you know, 16 to 18 inches and what wood material do we have, it starts a different kind of conversation. If you, if you come in with a really, really nice design and leave space for the feedback, because that's almost every single time we do, we have a collective commenting process for a design. I'm always that weirdo dude that went to, this, you know, had loves art and architecture and whatever, and also hates art and architecture um, as professions has, has it has been practiced i i do love design and and i'm an artist and i'm a musician so i'm the one that was like what weird thing you got next but the human relationship with big mike the carpenter rudy who's gone to school with the, who knows stuff 
Coco, who's around the area that says like, this is what we want to introduce to this site. Does it make sense to you? Nah, I have no idea what the hell you're talking about. So check it out, boom, you have a sketch, then it becomes this an initial iterative pass. So yes, it starts with this kind of balance point, inflection, the, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's a fulcrum moment. You create the right conversation for true participatory engagement. And then let's be real, overly democratic does not work. You got to start the thing. You can't talk too damn much. You got to start it, build it, create some feedback. Sometimes it doesn't go so smooth. You're like, I don't like it. It's ugly. You're like, well, why is it ugly to you? Oh, we'll try and sit on it. We are actually living sculpture benches. I tell I kid you not. We started off, people were like, what the hell is this? Like, it's a bench. This ain't no damn bench. It's a bench, you're sitting on it. You're like eating it, we're having a market. It's a bench. Well, I guess it is kind of like a bench, but it's a sculpture. Then all of a sudden it's like, I'll meet you at the living bench. The naming convention starts to take shape. The feedback loop works. Somebody says, I want to do this with this name. Somebody like, nah, wrong name, don't do that. As a starting point and then over time with frequency. So this is the biggest part. In the problem. A lot of times design and artists and architects will do something and then they'll just parachute it in and it just lands there. There's no relationship to it. There's no understanding to the material. Who did it? Who built it? What's the labor? All of a sudden it's to totally alien, totally outside. Then it's like, I don't know how to engage in it. It becomes a symbol of something else. Right? And then, and then it goes south, it goes very wrong very quick because where's the interplay? There is no, so unfortunately, a lot of times those come from dollar first, they actually overspend, most projects are over budgeted. Um, so we, we, do, we try our best to do this balance point of, of yeah, tensegrity. Yeah. Thank you, that was really helpful. Would anyone else like to chime in here? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, go ahead. Okay. Um, I guess I should turn on my video, shouldn't I? Um, uh, a very obvious, and forgive me, uh, maybe too much of an art question. Um, but what is the relationship between what you're doing and what the Astor Gates is doing? Uh, it seems to be the other Chicago example of this kind of community building by uh, communal making <clears throat> and also uh, making artifacts that are uh, carriers of memory as well as hope. Uh, and, and yet you have some different definitions. I would just love to hear you riff a little bit on uh. how you what the relationship is between what he's doing and what you're doing. Well, um, and I don't know the politics of it, so maybe I'm like stepping on something. So no, 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 no. apologies if I do, but no, I mean, it, it, we're just on a theoretical level. On it, hmm, because that's the thing. If you go beyond the theoretical to be grounded, you actually understand that there's no, there's not a dynamic relationship. Yeah. Um, so there are, it's different. Its starting point is different. The audience ultimately is different. The valuation and a, approach towards economics is totally different. Um, the intended in audience and outcomes is very different. Um, the real estate valuation or the protectives, the protection to keep people is very different. Um, once one initially starts from an institution tied to an institution that has a very, very, very challenged political history of development and displacement. So that's not us. We have a very different starting point. One is valued, one is not. How is it possible that we don't have to this day political support. I mean, that's just odd. 
especially when we cross pollinate audiences all the time, but we also have a space where people just show up. So just a different approach, different fun. And also like, look, we, we're growing folk, we grow food for the community. People show up, we feed people, we talk about education first, we talk about values of this stuff, but it's not necessarily to get that big valuation play. You know, it's just fundamentally different. Now, what I would say is that life, life needs differences. It needs for people to have actual conversations of, about these differences. And, you know, then life evolves. Sure. That was a very political answer. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is very political. I mean, it, it is interesting to me because Gates, of course, makes the argument that what he's doing is removing value from a white community and from a white institution and putting it into a black community uh, and along the way, erasing the white memory inherent in some of these objects and imbuing them with a, a black memory. I mean, that's part of what he's he talks about. Um, whether or not you believe that, certainly the earlier projects are more believable in that sense than the, than the bank project and some of the other ones. But, but I, what I was trying to also get at is that there's a, uh, maybe we can talk about the value of craft Mm -hmm. What interests me is the value of craft and knowledge through craft, mm -hmm. which also has a Chicago tradition going back to Hull House. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and there's a, it, not just Gates, but there's a bunch of people in Chicago who have been working on that in, in different areas. Let me ask it this way. Do you foresee, do you first of all see the craft tied to memory, which you seem to be, Mm -hmm. And if it's tied to memory and to specific memory, how can the embedded knowledge in that craft be transferred to people making things in other communities or for other communities or in other situations? So how does it, that move or does it stay completely self-enclosed? No, I mean, I, I would hope that the president's, the presentation spoke for itself where it's not yeah. self-enclosed. Yeah. Right. It's not. So how, does it, how does that work? Right, how does it work? By creating something that's like a, a, a very different a dynamic outlier condition, right? We are, think about where we're located. You're, um, we're in a spot that is formally zoned between manufacturing, um, residential and commercial. It's the intersection of this zoning that has this embodied memory of what production logics are supposed to be. What we've done is blurred lines. That's why I use reference to liminal and liminality. We say, well, actually the, the house across the street is the objects are made across the street over here. And then the education is here and the food is going to cook here. And then you're just kind of drifting in this dream space in a dream waking space um, that then we create and cultivate in public space that then goes into a Maybe it does go into a gallery, but it doesn't go into a gallery for evaluation for a commodified for a commodification, right. which it creates a public audience and then welcomes them to come to us and then bridges the gap for our audience to go to them. So it's like we've the reason when we were asked to host be host site for the architecture biennial, it's like our norm is for everybody to show up. And it's it's but it took time is a slow pathway for that it was a slower trajectory of development and iterative process of aesthetics that is fundamentally very different of who makes what we do we do right. if you it's different if you hire somebody else to make something with the look and feel of a look of a certain type of narrative versus the actual narrative and then it becomes the conversation is the narrative for the commodification of the narrative versus the actual outcome that is celebrated and lived and learned and shared and practiced and then built and reiterated and then it refines an aesthetic. It's just different. And it's welcoming. Well, I, I look forward to the biennial, that's for sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. And again, I can't stress this enough. It's like, there's so many different takes on how to do work, how to do, it's just, a, it, it is really important um, to have wider ranges of conversation because I think the conversation is get so caught up in 
economic valuation that becomes myopic and it actually becomes detrimental to the possibilities. Um, Great, uh, Keith, go ahead. Thanks. Um, thanks again for joining us. It was a, a great talk, really, really inspiring. Makes me want to get get out in my garden. Wish I wasn't <laughs> spending so much time on schoolwork. Um, I just wanted to, I, I kind of, I appreciate like what you keep going back to about like the, the care of like the words that you choose and kind of like the naming conventions. Um, and one of the, the terms that you use several times, um, biodynamic, biodynamic feedback. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you could talk about that a little more because it seems, you know, I'm sure it's it's chosen very intentionally. Um, yep. I'm not sure if there's like a history to that, but it seems like it, it really leaves space open kind of for, for that feedback to mean potentially human feedback or non-human feedback and yep. also like you talked about like the appropriate use of technology that like respects nature so it's like not not necessarily like technologically kind of aligned either like it could be very low tech could be very high tech so i was just wondering if you could talk a little more about that yeah that absolutely term. so you know um i think in 2012 there was a challenges in vertical vertical farming national international conference and we were part of it and i was like yeah you know it's that was the first time that that that, that came out um, for me. It's just biodynamics or just biomimicry. If anybody knows about biomimicry in the architecture world, um, there is a conversation and it, there's tears to this as well. It's like as a reference point or as a metaphor of like how termites might create a ventilation system naturally to cool. And then in, I think, it, that buildings resulted as a result of the study of these termite hills. Um, is anybody familiar with this? Uh, hopefully, you know, just look up biomimicry. Then you have a different kind of conversation where say people say like, it looks like a shell. And therefore I iterate the aesthetic of the shell to symbolize the shell and somehow, but that's not necessarily biomimicry. Um, for, for us, the biodynamic informatic system. So it's like, what is the biological? What is the, now biology is the study of life. So what are the human points? What are the ecological points? What is water, soil, air, air quality, um, bioremediation? If you're gonna do something like the, a restaurant, and somebody wants to figure out what's the future design of a restaurant when you can grow, you need to understand what air flows are, temperature, you need to understand that the habit, the, you're not, if you grow tomatoes year round, your temperature has to be at a certain point with also with light. So you're, unless you're actually thinking about other forms of electrical supplement, your energy bill is gonna be ridiculous. Um, when you walk into one of our spaces outside that are with polycarbonate or heavy gauge plastic that is more of a farming technique in traditional agriculture, they have a higher R value. So the insulate, so the light and sunlight that comes in keeps and stays in. So instead of adding energy to our spaces, we're maximizing the sun. So it's not uncommon that we're going into a space and it's 20 degrees outside, but it might be 50 or five or 60 degrees inside that space. We understand the habitat that works for us versus if it's a greenhouse, we understand the temperature needs, the variations of fluctuations. So here's an example. Anybody know what a sensor push is? So sensor push is, um, it's, 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 a, it's a sensor that you can then access from your phone and I can get Bluetooth real-time feedback of what's happening with the temperature. And the, you know, it's, it's a really cool thing, but by having one in our chicken coop, one in the greenhouse, one in the workshop, one in the thought barn, 
or one of the one in the smart pod, one of this, we're creating an understanding and awareness of every single space over the course of a year to two years to three years to four years to five years, and you're actually learning, you're habituating the spaces. And so you know which ones are good for humans, which ones are good for agriculture, what's the seasonality, what's the temperature, what's good for chickens in a polar vortex. <laughs> you know, what is insulation really when you get into that? Um, what translate to what do you do if you wanted to have a tiny house for real not just like you know the utopian dream of a tiny house but you actually live in the thing how does that work so we're learning our solar solar is tricky but there is some really serious value of solar because all of our outdoor spaces that don't have public light we have solar lamps that create safety to the space which changes the conditioning of what's safe and what's not to the space, which changes the traffic, which changes the memory. Um, what's awesome is that somehow, some way, we have these parakeets that live here year round. It is bizarre. Like Harold Washington was a big fan, he was a black mayor of Chicago, he like had a big, really revered by the public, had this collection of parakeets. And when he passed, they set him free. And then they stayed. But every year we're like, damn, there's the parakeets. There they come. And then they perch on this one tree. And then there's the hawks over here. And then there's, the, we have 32 species of birds and we can understand them by call. But it creates a level of sensibility that we also watch the feeding patterns on the soil, on the farm, what's happening with the pest control naturally without herbicides or pesticides. It's just a different level of awareness and in tune and it creates a rhythm if that makes sense. It creates a different kind of um, awareness. You're just more in tune. Thanks. Okay, so there's been a question in the chat here from Mikhail. In these programs to bring life back to ignored minority communities, how do we solve the issue of ensuring that these programs are continuing to improve the surrounding area and are not forgotten after interests die from investors? Um, again, that's an external reference point. It's a good question, but it's an external reference point because our, our value is for our community. Um, and so we... Um, the reason why we call it the Commonwealth is to question what are you, what is, who and what is being invested in. For us, we've created a network of value-based partners and we choose to only accept support from people which we share value. So we do not take funds from people that do not share our values. We do not invest in properties without the understanding that the value will come to add to valuation of the, for the neighbors, for the neighborhood. So the challenge and trick is when you look at like CLTs, community land trusts, um, when you look at other forms of cooperative work and initiatives, which are informing how the, com the Commonwealth does evolve and exist, um, it's not from a traditional standard single bottom line ROI. The return on investment is shared by all of the community investors. Um, and then we also, the reason why we have an apprenticeship program and a mentorship program and then all of the other things is it creates this, this shared wealth system. Um, you know, it's, it's got a generation to go. But the outcomes are really interesting because for whatever reason, the same house that was valued at 31,000, it was appraised when it foreclosed is now gone up. But we also share a relationship with our neighbors to say, hey, how do, you, how do you stay? How do we keep you here? And if we build new housing, which is the focus and plan, how do you create a balance point that says, well, you bring in new forms of money that then support the education 
that then supports for shared housing opportunities that's actual affording affordable housing that actually keeps people here and brings people in there is a way to do it and so we're looking at a lot of different ways and platforms to do it so it's not really just from an external investor point of view it's um we have the right value based partners All right, I'll turn to a question we prepared. So I guess part of the reason that we try to bring in lecturers and speakers like you is to get something different, something that normally we don't really talk about in, in these like privileged higher education realms. And so I'm wondering, what is the actual role of the university and its students in doing these things of bringing value back into communities that the university is, has treaded their feet on, has um, taken over with an emphasis on people, I guess. In like in our space of the Commonwealth or We're, in general? As a role of the universities and students, I guess. So yeah. what, what do we have? Oh, yeah, I got it. You, you are, <laughs> you're the clients technically for the universities. So you should be demanding what you need to demand, which is um, a balance of education in order to support the human relationships and applied knowledge formation. You should, you should be, you should be getting that. Um, in our space, again, why we call it apprenticeships, fellows, uh, humans and residents, mentors, there's these different terms that we use for this reason. Local area apprentices are local area apprentices that otherwise would be, uh, they're, they're just victim, victims to systemic processes. Um, we've got folks that have not been valued for education. Certain types of access to education has been limited. Um, uh, folks that have had very serious traumas with police and reform systems and just because you didn't get through school, we're not going to devalue you as the system normally would. So we have local area apprentices that come to us. Now we pair them with fellows. So we have a fellowship program. And when you, if you as a college student, as a university student, or as a person of privilege want to actually come in in fellowship with the community, there's very intentional languages in fellowship meaning you're sharing a life experience so you're going to offer what you have and vice versa it's a reciprocal engagement i want to share with you what i can do what i know because i got a certain level of smarts that you don't have there's a saying common sense ain't always common so then there's also like do access and privilege or travel or whatever, just different life experiences. We just recognize it and we create this balance point. It says you come in in fellowship with each other to celebrate and share the realities of this life and vice versa. So we create these moments where we can also create shared projects, shared trips. So it's not uncommon that we've sent our apprentices with fellows to somewhere else, to another city to another value-based partner. Then you have mentors that come in or humans and residents, artists, what have you, international MacArthur Fellow Network. We're all in the same kind of group. Then we ask the students to find the right faculty member within the institution to then welcome us into the syllabus. So it's an inversion of a little bit, I mean, and it's intentional. A lot of times uh, the faculty will come to us, but then, you know, as a faculty, there's a realm of like, a, there's a rhythm. There's a rhythm that you're caught in, um, you're a mentor, you're a guide, but then also you have too many students. And then, so we want to find the right students within that realm with the right faculty, but then we talk to the deans and we talk to the structural change. So we do have some formal commitments. When we started off, I actually made a point not to have any university students as part of our ecosystem. I mean, you could come in for a tour, you could support. We did not want to have the Zeus syndrome thing. 
you want to cultivate internal healing first, then you can do the bio dynamic thing where you change because it's just so it's so, you know somebody could say the wrong thing without meaning it and then it's then it becomes a curatorial exercise of like no nah, that's not what they meant that's what this you know, you know so it was this slower pace of welcoming the university in but it's also under our parameters that make sense because we had to we have to build public trust locally we're in the game of public trust and you go into a partnership with an institution, you just become, you, you just represent that institution and the growth machine dynamics of that institution. So now it's working. I mean, we have folks from around the world that are saying like, all, all <laughs> we have spaces for fellowships for urban ecology global fellows. Um, so if you are interested, send us a portfolio, you know, what have you. And then we have allocation of support for that. It's paid, you know, stipend programs um but then any of the values and the money that we get we try to invest as low as locally as possible into the human infrastructure okay. so so just to be clear yeah universities are now especially with the moment in the world want to try to figure out how to do better and want to be supportive but at the end of the day institutions are going to be institutions at how they're as they're programmed and so um we have we're creating spaces for these conversations and the reconciliatory platforms to exist um so they're starting to have more of a conversational role we 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 have not yet had any like firm commitment or support from institutions like that yet. Oh yeah. Cool. All right, uh, Matthias, you want to ask a question? Yeah. Um, well, thank you first for your presentation and lecture. Um, so I actually have two questions. Um, the two by four construction typology seems to dictate most of your problem, uh, most of your projects, from its wide accessibility, relatively low cost, the fact that you can upcycle it. Mm -hmm. um, from garbage dumps and you can extend the life of the material itself. It's, you're not wasting trees. Um, how do you begin to integrate other material construction typologies that are not as accessible? Yep. Do you just not, do you upcycle these harder to get materials or is there a way to make them more accessible? For sure. I mean, there's a natural conversation with between there's, I mean, think about first start, think about what's wasted at exponential scale. So we started with the wood because it's constantly available. Where do you think wood is available? It's not just like in the dumpsters. It's not just on the side in pallets and crates. Who has it? Who throws it away regularly? Ironically, universities, art institutions, galleries, museums. I mean, we're talking like exponential. Um, bus shelters, new developments, windows for those glass buildings um, there is an ecological irresponsibility that needs to be addressed so we created a precedent and a dynamic to be understood and translated because it applies to every single city that we interact with so there is the possibility of you our glass metal steel wood now, how, how available is steel? What machinery do you have to have and what access to machinery do you have to in order to do that? There is a different level of sensibility and reality of wood. There's a different malleability of wood. So it's a great educational framework and you can start to move up, but then you, you're looking at infrastructure development costs. If you cannot get the right support for in infrastructure development costs, then it, it limits what you do for material. We have partners that do have access, but we've, we've also had challenges, I'll put it this way, in a city that is designed to be so segregated, to have such lack of access to certain types of shops and machineries, you're hard pressed to find access to a MIG welder easily. You also have to do that indoors, in a shop, with the right ventilation, all, like all of that. 
So with the right support, then it changes. And so we're actually starting to talk to right now, we're working with um, um, two other international artists, Mel Chin and Inigo Mangalino Ovalle, they're MacArthur Fellows. And we're doing some public art installations um, in our spaces that incorporate other materials. And we're starting our other material workshops. Uh, how appropriate for the question, you'll see them this summer in, into the biennial. It's just access. I mean, it's like, it's like shit. Like, it's just access and support, really. And we can make some like brick, are you kidding me? All this brick that's available. I mean, the, the way we've exploited brick or not celebrated brick or just tear brick down and don't even appreciate brick is crazy. So making bricks or, you know, bringing that back or just saving bricks is just amazing. Thank you. Um, and then my second question is uh, that <laughs> the Sweetwater Academy seems to bridge a gap between design, community, uh, community engagement, ecology, the environment. Um, how critical is bringing up the notion of expert only and relying more heavily on the tacit knowledge of local residents and the success of such a collaborative process? I mean, there's no expert. Yeah. There is no expert. And a lot of times folks, when they come in with a certain level of pedigree or expertise, then it's not actually taking into appreciation how time and change and technologies change and all types of other stuff. There's like there now. So there are folks that are masters of their craft or masters of what they do in the knowledge formation processes, what have you, for sure. Um, now, expert expert is a finite definitive parameter for us we are lifelong learning um, you can reach a certain level of a degree of expertise degree but what the um, i don't know something that needs to be really discussed and explored because if you're just if i'm just an expert at this um there's a certain language that starts to come associated with it that reifies the expertise. And this, this plays out all the time in like public meetings for development projects or what have you. Um, if I start saying the dynamic juxtaposition of the materiality of the life culture of this and that, you know, the, the aesthetic of the red and the transformative principles of the white and then the glow of the, the, uh, the sunset and the water, I mean, we can do that but it's alienating. Um, and honestly, it hides and masks the vulnerability of the person that thinks they are the expert and they actually don't know. So there's different, there's different philosophy. Well, thank you. You ever you familiar with Gramsci and organic intellectuals? Uh, no. Sorry. And cultural hege hegemony, like, yeah. So there, there, it's, there is a lifelong dream of learning that's shared and it does rely on a balance between the procedural knowledge, which knows how to do things and the actual tacit knowledge and knows how to nuance them. And adjust and improv. Awesome, well. I think to be respectful of everyone's time and Emmanuel's time, that's probably a good note to conclude on. And perfect for dinner and us, back to my family, it's perfect. Yeah, give us something to think about tonight as well. So um, thanks everyone for coming to this event and for Emmanuel and Sweetwater Foundation for uh, taking the time to connect with us. Give us an eye-opening presentation, really fantastic discussion. Uh, and frankly, just something we don't really talk about already in school. So it's kind of like the whole motive as students, we try to build a lineup for people to come talk. And I appreciate you. I mean, honestly, I was like, Virginia Tech. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like the new connection. And I appreciate the new connection and I actually appreciate the faculty that have come on this journey and the openness of the faculty that are opening their worlds and their kitchens and living rooms and pajamas. Um, 
it's cool. It's a different humanizing moment in the world. And let's let's do something with it. Yeah, Chris says ha. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you again, Emmanuel. Um, I hope we can get to meet you in Chicago sometime. Look, if you don't come through, I'll be a violated. Like, I, you know, <laughs> trust me. I'll, don't right. do that. We'll definitely keep in touch. All right. Thank you so thank much you. to everyone. Hope everyone has a nice night. Um, just quick reminder for next week's lecture. We have Andrew Freer from Rural Studio, so don't forget to show up next week. Thanks, everyone. The other Loeb fellow. Yeah. I'm telling myself what's up. <laughs> All right. All right. Have Thanks nice again. Night, Thank you. Appreciate y'all. Cool. See you all. Yeah, I'll see you, Emmanuel. See you in the fall. Yeah, come through. <laughs>